you can count on. This is ABC 13 News at 6. In the moment a trigger is pulled, everything can change. Loved ones are lost. There's nothing else to say other than it is your worst nightmare. Families are left heartbroken. What human would take the life of another human with 17 bullets? Communities are shattered and lives are ruined. If you get into it, nine times out of 10, you either go on to prison or you go on to the cemetery. It's a threat that impacts everyone. This isn't uh, a political issue. This is about safety for our kids, our teachers, our citizens. Every school. The reality of it, I'm trying to prevent your student from being shot or killed. Every hospital. Every day we see a patient with a gunshot wound or a stabbing. And every neighborhood. Tonight, only on ABC 13, as the violence rises, what's being done to stop it. Good to have you with us tonight at 6, Voices Against Violence. In this ABC 13 exclusive, we're taking a deeper look at the spike in gun violence nationwide. We have team coverage tonight, but first, we want you to hear from people who have been impacted. I spoke with families who've lost children to the violence. Brenda Moss and Nadine and Dave Durbin are parents whose lives changed forever with a knock at the door. And I was like, who is this knocking like that? And it was the neighbor across the street. And she said, Sean has been shot. They asked us to have a seat in the dining room table. And, you know, they tell us there's been an accident. And it's just your worst nightmare. Nothing more I can say than that. It's just your worst nightmare. I think both our jaws hit the table when we found out that it was home invasion. In that moment, you move in slow motion because you don't want to connect the dots. You don't want to connect the fact that someone just said your oldest son was just shot. Brenda's son, 34-year-old Sean Moss, was shot 17 times on 11th and Polk Streets in 2014 in Lynchburg. I'm waiting to hear the next morning Sean tried to tiptoe up the stairs to look in my room to see if I'm okay. I didn't hear it. Now reality is beginning to set in. He's not coming back. You're in shock. Nadine's 22-year-old son, Aaron Brumfield, never came back home either. He was shot and killed in his bedroom during a home invasion on River Oak Drive in Forest in 2018. There were so many shots fired, you know, through the walls and through the door. It, his room was just riddled. I mean, there were bullets everywhere, walls, pictures, furniture. Did you see all that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've when seen it. When you see that, see. Well, her, for, her first comment was, this is, wasn't a murder. This is an assassination. Their loss, incomprehensible. What human would take the life of another human with 17 bullets? How do you comprehend the violence and the ruthlessness of it? That moment, that moment when somebody made a decision, how do you comprehend that as a parent? You no, know, there's just no respect for human life. And I literally looked at this picture and realized that 34 is the same age of when he got shot. Oh my gosh. As they cling to the memories of their sons. Sean was just large in life. Aaron was just starting into his young man stage. Both families wanted to share their stories of loss, hoping to impact the epidemic of gun violence coming to a crescendo in our community right now. When you look at gun violence, there has to be communication. There has to be 
a we believe in the Second Amendment. We believe that you have the right to to have a firearm, um, but you have to have respect for it. You have to know how to use it. Honoring Sean is doing what I'm doing right now, speaking out, saying, once you make the decision to pull that trigger, there's no going back. The killers in both of these cases are still behind bars. And since the deaths of their loved ones, both those families have started foundations or given to mental health organizations in their names. We have a link to those if you'd like to check them out at WSET.com. Stories like these are all too familiar. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, one in five people say they've had a family member killed by a gun. They also found that 54% of people say they or a family member have either experienced the shooting or been threatened with a gun. And according to the CDC, in 2021, Virginia ranked 16th in the nation for most gun-related deaths. 14% of the deaths in the state were gun related. 34% of crimes involving guns are gang related, according to the Department of Justice. In Virginia, that's concerning because the Attorney General says gang involvement is growing in every region. ABC 13's Kelsey Childress is live with how Lynchburg police are cracking down. Right, Danner. Well, the FBI says there are 33,000 violent gangs across the country. Now, together, that's about 1.4 million gang members. I sat down with Lynchburg police and former felons about what can be done. One thing we know about gangs is usually guns, gangs, and drugs all go together. Gang violence is a problem sweeping the nation, but also impacting us here at home. The Department of Justice says most gang-related homicides involve drugs. It's a, a vicious cycle. If, if you get into it nine times out of ten, you either go on to prison or you go on to the cemetery. That's how Howard White with Lynchburg Peacemakers describes the reality of gangs and drugs. It's a reality he and other Peacemaker members know well. I was a heroin addict for 26 years. I got in trouble for a violent crime and uh, I fell into the system and I did 21 years in prison. Now, they're using their journeys to inspire others and help cut crime. I never want to see a juvenile go through what I had to go through. You got to show them that you love them in the street. Lynchburg police are also cracking down on gang-related violence. Currently, there are about 17 active gangs in the city. Would you say that most of the shootings in Lynchburg are gang-related or involve gang violence? I would say a significant number of them are. And your department has been working hard to cut down on gang violence. What are some of those specific ways that your officers in your department is doing that? We have a violent crime response team that we partner with Virginia State Police on. Uh, they're in here regularly riding with our officers, and those officers are focused on guns, gangs, and drugs. Have you seen that they've helped to decrease gang violence and gang-related violence in our city? Again, hard to quantify some of that. Uh, it's hard to prove a negative sometimes. Uh, I will say it certainly kept it from getting worse without a doubt. And parents' gangs start targeting your kids as young as elementary school, according to the Attorney General's office. So here are some warning signs that you can look out for. Changes in behavior, unexplained injuries, and new nicknames. We're live in Lynchburg tonight. Kelsey Childress, ABC 13 News. The idea is to send a message um, that we're not going to tolerate uh, high levels of gun violence and gun crime. The violence problem in Virginia has the attorney general's attention. ABC 13's Noreen Turin breaks down his plan to put a stop to it. Well, Attorney General Jason Meares says his Operation Ceasefire plan is making significant progress in its first year. It's aimed at reducing violent crime by targeting the serious and repeat offenders. Miara says data shows that violent crime is overwhelmingly driven by that group. It makes sense if you want to lower violent crime, you go after that 2 to 5 percent that are overwhelmingly driving and are the repeat offenders. Miara says with this program, when a member of that group commits a crime, they go after them with vigorous prosecution to try to get them behind bars. The General Assembly set aside $5 million for Operation Ceasefire last year. Back to you. The potential threat of gun violence at school is a reality for children. We've seen multiple school shootings this year, including the shooting at the Covenant School in Tennessee. Six people died in that shooting. ABC 13's Claire Foley spoke with 
school resource officers in our schools about what they do to keep your children safe. Claire. Mark and Danner, the images of school shootings are heartbreaking. And for school resource officers, they're a reminder that preparation is key. Many times, officers only have seconds to react. In Lynchburg, Officer Elsa Ramirez has been a school resource officer for six years. She's seen a lot during her time, including guns in schools and multiple lockdowns. She says that the relationships she's built in that time are what make the difference if danger strikes. I have students who are willing to send me a text message or a staff member send me a text message saying, hey, this is what we just observed on social media. So I'm getting all of this intel, I'm getting all of this information that I normally wouldn't get as a patrol officer. Currently in Lynchburg, they have an SRO in every middle and high school. Tonight at 7, how the quick thinking of an SRO in a different district saved the life of a student after someone had plans to kill them. Live in Lynchburg, Claire Foley, ABC 13 News. Coming up, local hospitals have seen a spike in gunshot victims. How it's impacting their resources. This special edition of ABC 13 News continues with a look at how gun violence is affecting our health care system. Emergency rooms have to stay ready because of an influx of gunshot victims. ABC 13's Paige Meyer shows us how. Gun violence in our community is impacting those who save lives. It almost means every day we see a patient with a gunshot wound or a stabbing. Dr. Brian Coyer, the trauma medical director with Carillion Memorial Hospital, says 10% of their patients come in here with a gunshot or knife wound. Many people know in our community that continues to increase um, each year. Carillion saw a 48% increase in gun-related injuries in two years. If there's two or three gunshot wound victims that come in, you've got to you know, do your best to make all those resources efficient for those three patients. The same issue at Lynchburg General Hospital. It's keeping us busy. Um, we're, we're constantly ready. When a gunshot victim comes here to Centra or over at Carillion, they work with local law enforcement and have a strict safety protocol in place. First, both hospitals lock all interior and exterior doors like this one. There's also a path of badge clearance one must go through to get into these emergency rooms. Both hospitals say this gun issue isn't going anywhere without your help. LGH offers Stop the Bleed classes, which trains you to help in an emergency before the professionals arrive. It's essentially just a way of teaching people what to do, what to do if these catastrophic injuries happen. Carillion received $550,000 in grants from the Department of Justice to hire community members to pair up with gunshot victims. If they're safe to go home, then what do we need to do to start changing their trajectory? The hope for both of these programs is to save lives and put an end to gun violence. Reporting in Lynchburg, I'm Paige Meyer, ABC 13 News. With gun violence rising, the big question is what's causing it? The one thing that multiple sheriffs say is behind the spike. Enforcement leaders in our community are on the front lines of the gun violence fight. I sat down recently with three of them. They tell me that while there's no silver bullet to end gun violence, there are some things that can be done to reduce it. Bedford County Sheriff Mike Miller, Campbell County Sheriff Whit Clark, and Appomattox County Sheriff Donald Simpson. Between them, more than 100 years of combined crime fighting experience. What's the greatest cause of gun violence? Is it gangs? Is it drugs? Is it something else? We have seen an uptick in our drugs. In our community, it's going to be the drugs. Is gangs, drugs, those kinds? There's certainly factors. All three men are strong supporters of gun rights. Limiting firearms is a, is a slippery slope to go down. When it comes to assault weapons, though, do you do you draw the line there? Would you like to see more done? No, I think right now, again, I, I think according to the Second Amendment, people have a right to own firearms. I'm a Second Amendment person. I believe in the Second so Amendment. By, so, if you want to own an assault weapon, if you want to own any gun that it, that can be legally purchased, you're you're for it. Yes, sir. After every school shooting. Nearly everyone talks about finding ways to make schools safer. You know, we've 
have a grant for 14 school resource officers. So our goal is to have a school resource officer in every school. We try valiantly to have an officer in every school every day. You said you try, so there may be some days that there isn't an SRO and in we, a school. We make our best effort to make sure an officer is at every school every day. We want to harden the target for people wanting to come in and do bad things to our children and teachers. Do we need metal detectors in schools in order to help prevent some of these things from happening? I think that's something that the schools need to make a decision on whether they feel it's necessary to have. Metal detectors bring in an element of um, the conformity that I think to be effective, everybody has to play by the rules. What do you believe is the non-political response to gun violence, if there I even is one? Well, for, for me, this isn't uh, a political issue. This is about safety for our kids, our teachers, our citizens. Whether there's a D behind your name or an R behind your name, and come together for our citizens. And that's going to, our, uh, to the White House, all the way to Richmond. The sheriffs tell me the other thing that would help shoring up mental health resources. The men say every moment a person is in crisis, and especially those with a gun don't receive the care they need, only adds to the challenges we all face. We'll be right back. Bill has seen a massive drop in crime since police chief Scott Booth took over in 2018. ABC 13's Jacob Hunsaker sat down with him to find out how he's found success. Chief Booth implemented his plan to attack crime head on in 2019. In the years since Danville police implemented this new plan, violent crimes dropped and considerably. Look at this change. 1,061 violent crimes were reported from 2015 to 2018. Then the new plan took effect. 110, 109, 162, 128. Almost 140 less violent crimes per year on average when compared to before Booth took over. That's down 52%. He says one thing they've done is to get proactive in high crime areas. The department has been working in those spots to build a better bond between the police and the community. More people trust you. They're going to give you more information about crime as it happens. They're going to call you when crime happens. So building that trust and legitimacy, I do think, was a cornerstone. One of the ways they've been doing this is by hosting community walks. That's where the department goes into these areas and asks people how the department can help. And coming up tonight at 7, the other local departments that are turning to Danville for help with their rising crime. Back to you. Storing guns safely can get expensive. How you can spend less than 15 bucks and keep your house safe. Owners don't safely store their guns, according to Johns Hopkins. ABC 13's Mia Nelson breaks down what safe gun ownership looks like. A firearm by itself it's not going to hurt anybody. It's simply a tool. It's the responsibility of the person that's controlling it to make sure that they're doing it in a safe manner. I spoke with Captain Thomas Fairchild with the Campbell County Sheriff's Office about safe gun ownership, including how to store a firearm when you bring it home. Captain Fairchild showed me two different gun locks that you can use to safely store your gun. One is a trigger lock, but Fairchild says with this kind, the gun can still be loaded. Works. As, as you see here, it just simply covers the trigger. Another is the cable lock. Here's how that one works. First, you're going to take the firearm and remove the magazine, right? Correct. Then you're going to lock the slide to the rear and make sure that the chamber is empty. Then you're going to string the cord through and lock it in place and then remove the key. Fairchild also says it's so important you are familiar with your firearm. How it works, how it feeds, extracts, ejects, fires. And training is an important step if you aren't. Please do not go out, buy a firearm, and carry it for self-protection until you know how that firearm works. I went online to see how much gun locks cost. On Amazon, I found a trigger lock made by Master Lock for $14, and I found a cable lock made by Premium Tactical Supply for $10. In Campbell County, Mia Nelson, ABC 13 News.
And we want to say first and foremost that you can see all of these stories online at WSET.com. Yeah, I'd encourage you to check that out. The, the victims' families that I spoke with that you saw at the beginning of the show, you can see the entire interview I did with them with that story. This is just the beginning of this yes. conversation. World News is next. We'll see you back here at 7. Thanks for watching.